This is the key theme of the entire model. Kids do well if they can. This is the belief that if this kid could do well, the kid would be doing well. If the kid isn't doing well, something must be getting in their way. It's also the belief that we all do well if we can. Parents do well if they can. Classroom teachers do well if they can. Administrators do well if they can. We all do well if we can, but in the case of kids, this kid, if the kid could be doing well, the kid would be doing well. Something's getting in the kid's way. Now you know what's getting in the kid's way. Lagging skills, unsolved problems. Now you know. And you've got the single-sided, single sheet of paper that I'm gonna teach you how to use soon to prove it. That's what's getting in the kid's way. That's the information that's been missing. The problem, of course, is that kids do all if they can is not what we've been believing. For most of human evolution, that, of course, is because we didn't have the research that's accumulated over the last 40 to 50 years for most of human evolution. We have it now. What have we been believing for most of human evolution? And in many places still do. All you gotta do is change one word and you're there. Kids do well if they wanna. Kids do all if they can and kids do all if they wanna are two completely different mentalities. They have completely different implications for what you're thinking about this kid and what you're doing with or to this kid to try to help this kid. Let's think about kids do well if they wanna for a little bit cause it sure is popular. If you have a kids do all if they wanna mentality and you're working with a kid who's not doing well, then the reason you think that kid isn't doing well because of your mentality, is because that kid doesn't want to do well. That, by the way, is how I was trained to think a long time ago, but I haven't been thinking that way for a very long time. That's because at some point along the way, I started asking myself some very important questions, like, why would the kid not want to do well? I mean, don't all of us do pretty much the best we can? in pretty much most of the circumstances we find ourselves in. Well, the kids do well if they want a mentality, has those questions covered, with some very popular concepts like secondary gain, competing contingencies. Now, just in case that's foreign terminology for you, let me put those into my own words. Here's what those mean. Get this. The kid has the skills to be doing just fine but doing poorly is working out better for the kid than doing well would. Now, whenever that comes out of my mouth, here's what comes out of my mouth next. What? Doing poorly is working out better for the kid than doing well would. How? How is doing poorly working out better for the kid than doing well would? Well, now it is time for us to cover some very popular characterizations of unlucky kids. None of them are true. All of them flow for them from the mentality that doing poorly must be working out better for the kid than doing well would. We'll just start at the top and go in order. He's seeking attention by doing poorly. You mean he has the skills to seek attention the right way but he's choosing to seek attention the wrong way because that's making his life go better? I've never seen it. I'm 2,000 unlucky kids in at this point in my career. A lot of them were in prison. I have, none of them wanted to be there. I have yet to meet a kid who had the skills to do well and was choosing to do poorly because it was making their lives go better. I'm not sure it exists, though I am open to it. I haven't come across that yet. I don't think it's accurate. I wouldn't say it. And yet in many functional behavior assessments, that is precisely what it says. All right then, he's manipulating us. You sure? See, I've been manipulated once or twice in my life by some highly competent manipulators, people who were really good at it. How do you know you're being manipulated by a highly competent manipulator? You don't. That's the point. You don't know when you're being manipulated by a highly competent manipulator. Competent manipulation is when you wake up, I don't know, four or five years later, and you say to yourself, oh my God. 
those people are good. But competent manipulation requires some very important skills, forethought, planning, impulse control, organization, skills the research tells us the vast majority of unlucky kids lack. All right then, how do you know you're being manipulated by an incompetent manipulator? Simple, if you know you're being manipulated, you're being manipulated by an incompetent manipulator. <laughs> He's bad at it. And I wouldn't worry about it too much. I also wouldn't say it. All right then, the kid is coercing us into capitulating to his wishes. There it is, coercion theory. That was my training now, a long time ago. Now I'm not trashing coercion theory in here. I don't believe it anymore. But here's what coercion theory basically says. He wants what he wants and he's pulling out all the stops to go for it. Want to know when he started doing that? The minute he was born. That's right, infants want what they want and pull out all the stops to go for it and that's crucial to their survival. I worry about infants who don't know what they want and who don't pull out all the stops to go for it. But here's what's supposed to happen as we develop. Boy, is that an important word, develop. We're supposed to develop the skills to go about getting what we want in ways that are skillful, in ways that are adaptive. Skills like empathy and uh, appreciating how one's behavior is affecting other people and taking another person's perspective. Skills, the research tells us, a very high percentage of unlucky kids lack. I wouldn't say that one either. All right then, he's unmotivated. Do you know that I would never say that about anybody ever? Why not? Because here's what I've learned. The minute we take a closer look, what are this kid's lagging skills? What are this kid's unsolved problems? We find that unmotivated doesn't even come close to capturing what's really going on with that kid. The trick, of course, is to take a closer look. <laughs> Finally, he's testing limits. Not really finally, but the last one I want to cover. Uh, raise your hand if you don't test limits. Huh. We all test limits. Interesting. Because that means that if you're saying that this kid is testing limits, you're saying something that's true of everybody in the room, in which case it is meaningless. We all test limits. If you say that about a kid, you've basically said nothing. Now, why do I put you through all these characterizations? Number one, because they're wrong. Number two, because we should not say them anymore. We should be referring kids purely, referring to them purely through the prism of lagging skills and unsolved problems, which is much more accurate. But number three, if you believe a kid isn't doing well because he doesn't wanna, I can only think of one thing for you to do. Only one role for you to play in the life of this kid. Make him wanna do well. Something us caregivers waste an enormous amount of time doing. How do you do it? The tools of the trade are very familiar to everybody in this room. I was trained in them. You punish the signals you don't like so as to see less of them. You reward the replacement signals you do like so as to see more of them. And you are now purely in the business of making a kid wanna do well founded on the belief that he didn't want to in the first place, if, by the way, those practices are founded on any beliefs whatsoever, uh, I find that those practices are frequently founded on no beliefs whatsoever. I and my colleagues work with a lot of schools, a lot of prisons, a lot of inpatient psychiatry units, residential facilities. <laughs> Whenever we ask them, why are you still doing what you're telling us isn't working? The number one response is, well, because it's the way we've always done it. Here's my attitude. If the way we've always done it hadn't been working for the kids we've always done it to, we probably ought to stop doing it and think of something better to do. And that is our challenge. That is our challenge. How do we better help the kids we are not helping now? And now the list. Here's the list. The list of interventions, very popular interventions, that solve no problems 
and teach no skills. The last one of these is going to break your heart. Timeouts solve no problems and teach no skills. Holding a kid in from recess solves no problems and teaches no skills. Keeping a kid after school solves no problems and teaches no skills. Detentions don't, suspensions don't, expulsions don't. Hitting a kid on the butt with a piece of wood to help the kid do good solves no problems and teaches no skills. Restraints don't, seclusions don't. There's one more intervention that I have to mention that solves no problems and teaches no skills. Stickers. <laughs> I'm sorry to be the one. Stickers solve no problems and teach no skills. And would you like to know why? This is, this is um, pretty blunt. Because you see, a sticker is just a sticker. In our society, stickers have taken on new meaning. Never lose sight of the fact that a sticker is just a sticker. I'm always telling adults, don't let stickers do your blocking for you. A kid cannot establish a relationship with a sticker. A kid cannot communicate with a sticker. A kid cannot solve problems with a sticker because a sticker is just a sticker. Now you might be thinking, oh, it's just a sticker. What's the big deal? Oh, what's the big deal? For the last 40 plus years, I've been working with the kids who don't get the sticker. 40 plus years, I've been working with the kid who doesn't get the sticker. And now here's what I've learned about those kids. Number one, not getting the sticker did not, not, did not move that kid any closer to getting the sticker. But even more importantly, we are distinguishing those who get the sticker from those who don't at very, very early ages. Do we really want to be doing that? especially since not getting the sticker doesn't bring the kid any closer to getting the sticker. Now, some of you might be thinking, yeah, but aren't stickers good for the well-behaved kids? You mean the well-behaved kids who would be doing well without the sticker anyhow? Talking about them? Why would you want to move a kid from intrinsic reinforcement to extrinsic reinforcement? Why would you want to do that? You wouldn't want to do that.